Well, thank you so much for being with us. You are a writer and a journalist, and I'd like to draw from the first chapter of your book, Regenesis. Uh, the first chapter is called What Lies Beneath, to kind of frame the conversation. So in researching the book, you write, you discover that you, you happened upon a gulf, a gulf between perception and reality, between widely accepted claims and scientific findings that applies this gulf applies to almost every aspect of our food systems. I thought as we get started here, if you could maybe describe some of these popular beliefs, these scientific findings, and how you managed to bridge the gap between them in your book, a book about what we eat and how we grow it. Thank you. Well, thanks, Alice. So, I mean, just about everything we think we know about the food system is wrong. And more than any other system, um, it's surrounded by myths, by wishful thinking, by gut instincts, understandably enough, um, and by a total failure really to grasp what the science is telling us. And possibly the biggest failure of all, which is also um, a failure which besets the environmental movement of which I've been a part all my life, is the failure to see that perhaps the most important of all environmental issues is the one we discuss least, which is land use. Land is the crucial environmental resource and every hectare of land that we use for our own purposes is a hectare that can't be occupied by wild ecosystems. And the great majority of life on earth depends on wild ecosystems to sustain it. And in fact, earth systems themselves depend on wild ecosystems. And so what we need to do is to take a strategic approach to land use. And in the scientific literature, there are hundreds, possibly thousands of papers which engage with this question and um, take a deep and intelligent and researched approach to the question of land use. And it almost never breaks the surface of public consciousness. Um, now, you know, occasionally we talk about land use when it comes to urban land and we talk about urban sprawl and we're quite right to be concerned about urban sprawl. Cities should be compact. Um, urban sprawl is bad for cities and bad for the countryside. But the entire urban area of the planet, all the houses, all the businesses, all the infrastructure occupies one percent of the planet's land surface. Agriculture, by contrast, occupies 38 percent of the planet's land surface. And the great majority of that is taken up not by crops to feed people, but uh, by animal farming. So about 12% of the land surface is um, for uh, uh, feeding, uh, is for producing crops. Roughly half of that land is producing crops directly consumed by people. The other half crops consumed by livestock. But the 26% that remains of the, the farmland on earth is used for grazing primarily of cattle and sheep. This is a phenomenal amount of land, more land than all other human activities put together is devoted to grazing livestock. Um, and, um, and all that is land with an ecological opportunity cost, in other words, what would be there if you weren't using it for grazing and with a carbon opportunity cost. So a classic misconception, you know, and this is just one example of hundreds and hundreds that I explore in the book, a classic misconception is that it's ecologically friendly to eat pasture fed meat and we should switch away from other sources of meat, which are all admittedly horrendous, and move towards pasture fed beef and pasture fed lamb as well. And all the celebrity chefs and food writers, farmers themselves, you know, uh, films highly on to say, yeah, this is the answer. It might be the answer if we had several planets and no room for wild ecosystems on any of them. But pasture fed meat is a classic example of agricultural sprawl of vast areas of land used to produce not very much food. And agricultural sprawl is the biggest cause of habitat destruction and species loss of all. It's, it's one of the primary reasons why the food system is by far and away the most damaging of all sectors for, for the living world. Uh, there was a study conducted in the United States which said what would happen if people did what the food is tell us to do, which is to switch away from corn fed beef, which is bad enough, to pasture fed beef. Well, you would need to expand the land area used to produce that beef by 270%. That means you'd have to cut down all the forests, drain all the wetlands, degazette all the national parks, demolish all the cities, and you'd still be importing some of your beef from Brazil. It just 
doesn't work. And throughout the food system, and, and as I say, this is just one small example of many, we've been focusing on the pictures and not on the numbers. We are food innumerate. And we need to see what the numbers show. We need to see uh, what it costs to produce certain kinds of food, what the ecological costs of that might be, what the land costs of that might be, sure. the water, costs, soil space. costs. And how would you say it? Well, I would say they meet through friends. And after dating for an appropriate amount of time, he takes her to a romantic French bistro. Then maybe, if the mood is maybe. right, I just bought you a big French dinner. That was your choice. I owe you nothing. Your hand was on my knee the whole time. What was I supposed to think? I was expressing affection, not signing a contract. This date is over. Come on, sex. Okay, thank you. That was a, a, a yeah a, a message from our sponsor. <laughs> Um, George, I'm sorry we, that totally cut you off. So I, I, I got to the end of that answer anyway. <laughs> this is this is hybrid technology and Zoom live. This is all really happening live in the 21st century. Um, that was it. Thank you for that opening um, prologue. I wish you had what could be here in person because the room kind of descended into into silence as you were speaking, and everyone was kind of mesmerised by the dire portrait that you have painted. And so to kind of put you in conversation about this portrait, I want to go to Emma. You were the founder and CEO of Climate Talk, a youth-led non-profit organization that's dedicated to understanding climate policy for young people. You've also very recently just completed your master's thesis at Sciences Po on the experience of citizens in the climate assembly. We're going to call this the CCA for the rest of the conversation to make this easier, uh, and in which the topic of food and agriculture, of course, came up. You quote one interviewee from the UK who says, food was the most contentious topic in the assembly. Some people would not engage in the idea of not eating meat or even reducing. Later, some of those people shifted a little bit in their position. Can you tell us more about your work on the CCA as it relates to this question of food? Thank you so much, Alice, and thank you, George, for this great uh, introduction. Uh, so yes, I just recently completed my master thesis, which was on deliberative democracy in climate policy, and more specifically, participants' experiences in citizens' climate assemblies, or CCAs. And for that purpose, I analyzed participants' experiences in six different CCAs. So that was in the UK, in Scotland, Denmark, France, Germany, and Austria. And so I collected responses from participants from all of those different assemblies. Um, I had 60 responses in total in, uh, in my survey, as well as conducted 19 interviews with participants, as well as 11 expert interviews covering the time from before, during and after the assembly. And one particularly interesting topic in, those, in that research was food, because food was both one of the most controversial topics um, as confirmed by both participants like the quote that you just read out Alice as well as experts um, so it was one of the topics according to one expert for example from the Austrian assembly where there was the lowest level of awareness of people who participated in the assembly as well as the highest level of defensiveness when it came to um, enacting change However, what I found particularly interesting is the potential for change once people are educated in a manner that is inclusive and that allows them to reflect by themselves and that allows them to deliberate amongst themselves. So what I found is that in all of the assemblies, you had suggestions for policies because at the end of such an assembly, for those of you who don't know, um, a citizen's climate assembly is put together via a lottery sample of the population of a particular country. Uh, and so you are supposed to have a, a sample of people that should represent the population of that country. Then they deliberate for a number of, usually it's weekends, and afterwards they come up with a booklet of recommendations for government. And that includes all different topics, including food and agriculture. And what I found particularly telling was that all of the recommendations included demands for changes in the agricultural system that were a lot more ambitious, a lot more progressive than what is currently happening in government. There were still differences between assemblies. For example, the Danish assembly had was still quite restrictive and quite opposed 
to reducing meat consumption. So when they had a vote, um, it was about 55% about of people voted that Denmark should reduce its meat consumption. Whereas on the contrary, in Germany, for instance, you had an almost 80% agreement that you should shift to a almost a, a, a diet that is as plant-based as possible. Um, so to very highly reduce. And that was quite telling for me because if you have such a, a low level of awareness at the beginning, but then at the end, you can have an assembly from that is composed of people from all, um, all areas of society that can then agree at almost 80% unanimously that you have to shift to a more plant-based, um, significantly more plant-based food system. I thought that was quite revealing and also helps us understand and potentially show how we could address that problem that is so rooted in society. Um, and I can talk more about how it is rooted in society, but I think I will pass on at the moment and then we can come back to that later. Thank you, Emma. Also, so over to Sebastian now. Um, you are, among other things, the head of IBRI, which is a think tank out of Sciences Po as well, which facilitates the transition towards sustainable development, which is based in France. And so most of your articles and most of your work is focusing on France and the European Union. And I wanted to return to this idea of the gulf that we invoked at the beginning, um, because in two recent articles that you published on Idri's website, you discuss similar kind of gulfs. So there's the gulf between, on the one hand, the importance of food issues, on the other, the ambition of public policies. In another article, a gap between what citizens declare about their reduction in meat and then a gap between their actual desire to reduce. In both articles, though, you cite the dominant narrative of the responsible consumer, this is the consumer citizen, is insufficient and even counterproductive. First, I want to give you a response to reply to George and Emma and then ask you about these questions. Thank you very much, Alice, and thank you for George and Emma. I, 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 I'm thrilled by the conversation. Um, so I'm, I'm on the side of those environmentalists that George has described as not critical enough about pasture land and grazing. So I don't want to open the debate now, but we might have it afterwards. Uh, but nevertheless, I think what uh, one thing on which we agree is the necessity to work not only on the supply side, but also on the demand side. Uh, we need to reduce the overall intake uh, of calories and within that, the share of animal protein, meat, milk and eggs, uh, all this is at stake. And, and not just the grazing animals, but also the pigs and the poultry that are not grazing and, and that eat a lot of the um, uh, of the vegetable production that we have. I mean, another number that I want to throw in the discussion that is, I think, really compatible with what George has been saying is that two thirds of the vegetable production that we have in Europe is fed to animals. Uh, and, and if we eat a little bit less of that, that necessitates that we exert much less pressure also on production on producing uh, vegetable production uh, to the extent that for the moment farmers are telling us we can't reduce the use of pesticides because we we need to produce a lot i don't believe we need to produce that much if we if we use if we work on the demand side quite heavily and so one of the gulfs that you're describing alice is the gulf between the need to have demand management policies uh, we we would say sufficiency policies um, and, and in French, it's, uh, the, it's the, the, the moment is about sobriety. Sobriety is probably misleading in English, but something like that. Sufficiency policies, uh, where we try to, to eat sufficiently, nutritiously, lots of savor, et cetera, but sufficiently and not always more. And that's, I think, uh, what we see. I've been working on a, on, a, on a study that was raising that issue in 2009. And they, the, the, the results is in the public debate they were telling me none of the policies that have tried to influence our food behaviors has ever worked. Um, and still after I was one of the experts uh, with the French Citizens Convention on Climate, and the citizens had lots of ideas of how we could try and have an influence on, on our food behaviors, on our food consumption behaviors, and not necessarily dictating what we need to eat. And of course, uh, uh, thanks God, they were not dictating us what we need to eat, but ways to influence, to eat meat, to, uh, uh, to, to change our food behaviors. Uh, but the government chose to say, oh, forbidding the uh, advertising on TV uh, at the hour when, where kid, children are looking at the TV of the less nutritious and most environmentally damaging food, that's too much. We should rather have a kind of a charter 
of voluntary commitments by the advertising industry. And so you see there is this kind of, I mean, this is very specific to our government. I'm not criticizing my government. They've been elected and they're a liberal government. So their vision of public action is to really freedom of, of, of enterprise is really paramount. And so they, want, they don't want to forbid things. But I believe we are in a moment where everybody understands we need to work on, on the demand, not just for environmental reasons, but for public health reasons. The way we eat in France is becoming always less good for public health. So we need to do something about that. And we're not the worst in the situation, but it's also the, the case of France. Um, but nobody understands how we could do that. And very often you hear, if we constrain the private sector, it would in the end constrain the freedom of consumers. And we argue just the contrary. If we want to give the consumer more agency and more freedom, we need to regulate the food processing and food retailing industry much more. And that's basically what we say in this, in the, in this, uh, in this document that you've quoted. Um, and, and just to come to this narrative of the, um, the responsible consumer, one vision that is very present is that we will be able to use the most aware of the citizens and consumers for them to be able to uh, make committed individ individual choices that would make their food more sustainable. And that this would be exempl through exemplarity, this would spread in society and then also exert pressure on markets and on, on the food processing industry to change what they, the, the supply side. Uh, that does not function for four reasons. And I stop after those four reasons in order not to just monopolize the word, but I think just for you to understand why we can be paradoxically saying regulating, constraining the food, food demand side is actually giving more freedom to the, to the consumer. First, this co uh, responsible consumer narrative does not function because actually the food, what is called the food environment, uh, the, the way we access food, uh, the supply of food by the industry, uh, the proximity of uh, food retailers to us, the uh, socio-cultural norms and standards in which we are embedded, all these is constraining our choices and it's much more rigid than what the, 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 the story of the responsible consumer is saying. Second, this is very present in all our societies, those front runners in consumption that do food activism are not aspirational for many other groups. Many other groups don't want to be like me, a Parisian guy who's uh, cycling to work and who's happy to eat less, more, more plant-based food. I'm not an example. People hate my, some people hate my, my example and they don't want to, they're not, it's not what they, I'm not a reference, nor an aspiration. And I respect that, but there are, we should not caricature either that the poorest in society would just be happy to do barbecues and, and stuff themselves with lots of meat. They also care for their, for their health. They have other aspirations, but it's not exactly an aspiration thing. So we should not rely on those who are doing the right thing to be aspirational by virtue that does not function. And so we need to think about the fact that we need to listen to all consumer groups and also think about their agency. When they are in a citizens convention, they understand that they don't need to be like me or to be agreeing with me, but they need to change their behavior for the environment and for health. And there are a variety of food diets that function. The WWF did a very good uh, study called the Live Well Report, where they showed that you can have a, 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 an English diet, a Greek diet, a German diet, very different, but all much more towards more plant-based, et cetera, et cetera. The last thing that I said that is not functioning in the, uh, in the uh, uh, narrative of the responsible consumer theory of change is that there are so many asymmetries of power in the food industry. So it's not true that if consumers change a lot, the food industry is going to change. They are defining much more than what they say uh, through, their food, what, through the formulation of new products, through marketing, et cetera. So we need, I'm not saying we need to forbid things. I'm saying we need to regulate what is a sustainable food products of the future? Because for the moment, a lot of the innovation in the food industry is not in the right direction, too much ultra processed and, and not, in the really not, not, not necessarily what we need. So these are the things on which I think we need to have a policy. And it's not because I'm French that I want to regulate things that can be compatible with other cultural contexts, but we need to take the food environment policy seriously. And that's not about dictating a food behavior. It's rather opening up the possibility for those who are, who struggle accessing nutritious and environmentally sustainable food to, to have it in the way they are happy to have it. Uh, and, and that's what, that's basically what I, I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, George, I'm going back to you in, in terms of order. First of all, we've just had two great kind of opening remarks. Would you like to respond to either Emma or Sebastian? Well, I would strongly endorse what they're both saying. I mean, we the asymmetries of power are tremendous, but they're also extremely dangerous in ways that many people don't apprehend. You know, we know that the banking crisis in 2008 was caused partly by um, certain banks becoming too big and too well connected with the rest of the financial system, where we see a very similar dynamic taking place within the food system. To give you one example, just four corporations control roughly 90% of the global grain trade. And, and what we see again in the scientific literature, but again, it, it does not ruffle the surface of public consciousness, are 10 years of warnings saying the food system is beginning to look like the financial system in the approach to 2008. And, and so that rather than a healthy, resilient system that damps down the shocks that affect it, we have a frail system which is amplifying shocks. And eventually, unless something is done, that system will fall over. Now, governments were able to bail out the banks with future money and to stop the collapse at the last moment, just before the whole financial system collapsed. But you can't bail out the food system with future food. And financial collapse would have been absolutely devastating to many of the world's people. But food system collapse, I mean, that's on a whole other scale. You know, if that happens, the rich will eat and nobody else will. I mean, it's just unimaginable what the impact of that will be. But it, it's a very similar dynamic. I mean, this is a complex system. It's a complex adaptive system, the food system, much as the financial system is, much as ecosystems are, much as the soil is, the oceans are, the atmosphere is, human society is. Most of the things that are important to us in life are complex adaptive systems, but hardly anybody studies them. You, know, you can go through school and university without ever, out ever coming across a complex adaptive system. And so we're constantly taken by surprise by their behavior. We expect them to absorb stress in linear and gradual ways, but they don't. They lose their resilience. We don't see the loss of that resilience. And then they suddenly collapse. And the possibility of food system collapse is a very real one. And there's a whole lot of potential external pressures on the food system now. Very severe environmental pressures in terms of droughts, heat shocks, um, a, a whole series of, of cataclysms caused by climate breakdown. Um, we also have very major constraints on fresh water um, uh, availability in crucial parts of the world, but there's also geopolitical and geographical pressures. So a classic geographical pressure is the fact that a very high proportion of the food that circulates around the world goes through very narrow choke points, such as um, the Turkish Straits, the Suez Canal, the Panama Canal, the Bab al-Mandab, the Straits of Hormuz, the Straits of Malacca. And it only takes a couple of those to close at the same time, and the shelves will empty for hundreds of millions of people. Now, we've seen two closures in the previous two years. One in 2021, when a bulk carrier got jammed across the Suez Canal, the Ever Given, and luckily they were able to dig it out and, and get it off the banks within a few days. But if they weren't able to do that, they would have had to unload it and it would have taken weeks. Um, even more luckily, that didn't coincide with the other major disruption we've seen recently, which was last year when the Turkish Straits was effectively closed by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Had both of those things come together, that could have been the tipping point. You know, that disruption might have been sufficient to be the trigger that collapsed the, the, the food system, just as the US subprime crisis was the trigger that collapsed the, the um, US financial system. Um, and, and so, you know, we, we are potentially on a knife edge. We don't know. We don't know how close to the critical threshold we are, but it's somewhere and we won't know uh, how close we are until we've actually crossed it, until it's too late, until it collapses. Now, because this hasn't happened yet, there's almost no public knowledge about it. People aren't switched on to it. But there are, are dozens of scientific papers desperately trying to warn us about this very real prospect. And, and reading them and seeing the way that this completely fails to translate into public concern, it's as if the scientists are behind a sheet of plate glass 
and you can see them banging on the glass and you can see their lips moving but you can't hear what they're saying that that's that's how governments and the media have responded to this we're just like we don't know what's going on there we're not listening we're not interested this could be the greatest threat to the greatest imminent threat to human society that we face and no one is talking about it Thank you. I wanted to ask a, a specific question, <laughs> um, it kind of in relation to this, but certainly in relation to your book. Another thing that you argue that no one else is talking about is, th is the soil. And you kind of gestured to this. You just talked about the soil. You say in the book that land use you've come to see is the most important of all environmental questions. What can be found underground? And can you tell us more about the importance of soil and how you first came upon it, given that no one is talking about it? Imagine well, a scientific paper. It, it, it's not quite true to say that no one is talking about the soil. I mean, it, it is true to say that within the media, no one is talking about the scientific findings on the danger of complex systems collapse within the food system. It's just a complete silence on that um, because no one seems to understand it in the media because there's so little scientific um, training within the media. Um, and people just don't read those papers. But soil, you know, there is growing awareness of um, our total dependence and the, the fragility of that dependence upon this crucial ecosystem. And many people don't even recognize it as an ecosystem, but soil is one of the most uh, diverse and abundant ecosystems on Earth. Um, it's it's as diverse as a coral reef or, or a rainforest. And, and beyond that is actually like a coral reef in that it's a biological structure it's created by the organisms that live in it it would not exist if it weren't for all the little things that that live there and build it and they they build it and on a fractally scale structure effectively using the carbon in the soil as the cement that sticks together the mineral particles and and bacteria do it at a tiny scale and then the little clumps which they build are built into slightly bigger ones by the tiny scuttling creatures the micro arthropods in the soil and then those uh, medium-sized clumps are built into bigger ones by um, earthworms and ants and other soil giants by comparison to everything else um, and this creates a remarkably robust and resilient structure, which is why we still have soil. I mean, if it weren't that robust, just ploughing it once would mean that the soil would all be washed off the land. Um, but even so, despite its remarkable properties, we are destroying it at a phenomenal rate. I mean, across uh, one survey of 70 nations, it found, found that um, the average rate of soil loss had risen by 12% in just 11 years. I mean, this, we're seeing a great acceleration of soil destruction. Now, 99% of our calories come from the soil, but we've scarcely bothered even to understand it. There's a tiny amount of money going into soil science. Um, and uh, you know, Leonardo da Vinci said, we know more about the movement of the cosmic spheres than we do about the soil beneath our feet. And that is still the case today. It's mind blowing. You know, here we are spending billions of dollars on investigating the surface of Mars, right, through the Mars Rover program. Because maybe one day we could transform it, we could terraform Mars and live there. Bullshit, we, you know, we're never gonna live on Mars. There's a whole load of reasons why we can't possibly live on Mars. But how about investigating the surface of our own planet, which we know almost as little about? In fact, by comparison to the amazing complexity and abundance of the surface of our own planet, we probably know less comparatively than we know about the surface of Mars. And yet almost no money is being put into understanding it. And again, it's one of those gaps. It's one of those lacunae into which the whole of humanity could fall. You know, this gap in our understanding. People talk about us having blind spots, right? Particularly in journalism. Oh, journalists have got blind spots. And we don't have blind spots. We have tiny spots of light and everything else is dark to us. We focus on a few issues, which generally are by no means the most important issues. And we ignore everything else. And a lot of what we ignore is much, much more important than the things we focus on. You know, and if we were really concerned about our, our survival, we would be relentlessly focused on soil trying to understand what it is, because we don't even really understand what soil is. You know, the, some of the leading soil scientists I spoke to say, you know, it just doesn't behave like any other system, any other ecosystem. We don't really know what's going on. Try to understand how it behaves, try to understand how it responds to the pressure, and then devise much better ways of growing our food without trashing it. 
Thank you. Um, I, I want to get slightly technical for a second because you're providing the beautiful descriptions and we can all in the room see why you're the journalist and the essayist because your powerful metaphors <laughs> are working. Um, and I would like to go to you to talk about this question of policy because it will set up questions that I'm going to ask Sebastian. Um, at Climate Talk, you're, as I mentioned in the beginning, you're dedicated to basically informing young people about policy. Um, how, what kind of challenges have you encountered in your work? How to attract young people to the less glamorous area of policy? How to explain more complicated policies? And what have you learned along the way in your mission of doing this? Thanks, Alice. And uh, yeah, thank you both for your excellent points that you've been making. Um, so yeah, at Climate Talk, we, are, we have the aim of demystifying climate policy for for everyone, but in particular for young people around the world, because climate policy, including food and agricultural policy, is an extremely complex and complicated topic. Um, if you're just looking to understand what is happening at international climate conferences, you are confronted with a bunch of jargon ranging from Article 6 to UNFCCC, the global stock take, all sorts of different terms and <laughs> that are incredibly difficult to understand. And we are losing so much potential from so many potential young activists because they don't feel like they can contribute if you are joining uh, a campaign and if you're wanting um, to get involved and you feel like you don't even know how things work and, and how to understand that. So that is what we are trying to do. And that was what we are trying to make accessible, understandable and transparent for everyone. So we've been reporting live from like the previous two climate conferences, so from COP26, COP27, for example, of writing a bunch of different articles, including on food and, and agriculture. And there are not really that many, I mean, we have experienced obviously difficulties in getting people involved mostly from outside the climate bubble because it is such a bubble still to get people involved, but it has changed a lot. Like we have a lot of interest in, in volunteers. We've got over a hundred volunteers from like 25 different countries at the moment and an incredible and really an absolutely incredible team, uh, team of young people. Um, and the bigger difficulties that we are experiencing is when it comes to actual policies, because <laughs> um, that is um, where the young people have been absolutely amazing in trying to campaign for more ambitious policies and trying to get um, governments and decision makers to listen and trying to understand the policies. Um, but the difficulties really do lie on the other side and just to pick up on some points that have been uh, made by, by both Sebastian and George, I think we do have a big issue in particular in the food and agriculture side of policy, just looking at uh, the European Union, for example. Um, I don't know how many of you have um, heard of, for example, the Amendment um, 171. Um, which was due to be passed in October last year, and which would have been extremely restrictive um, to plant-based products and to market plant-based products. They wouldn't have been allowed to sell plant-based milk in cartons because that would have been an unfair competition in compared to dairy milk or uh, yogurt in the same form that um, actual dairy yogurt is, um, is being presented in. And this was stopped, but only due to a huge campaign um, of NGOs and 500,000 signatures of people from around, around the EU. But what is already in place, and that was put in by a court decision 2017, is that you cannot call plant-based alternatives by names that are usually reserved, as they have said, to dairy products. So you cannot call um, soy milk you legally cannot call that a vegan milk or even soy milk you cannot call um vegan yogurt yogurt you cannot call plant-based alternatives by the same name even if it is very clear that they are plant-based which is absolutely ridiculous because they have made exemptions in that court decision so the exemptions do not apply to soy for example but they do apply to spirituous beverages and soups that you can call creamy but you cannot call a plant-based cream alternative cream. So you kind of very much see the influence of the lobbies that are behind 
the regulations and you just have to look at advertising. The EU has plans to reduce meat and dairy consumption. However, its advertising definitely does not reflect that. They have spent, in last year alone, they have spent more than a third of their advertising budget, well, of their farming advertising budget on meat and dairy. They're advertising the products that they want people to reduce. And this kind of links into what you said before is that you cannot expect people to reduce something when you have trams going around Brussels advertising dairy milk. Uh, or just the other week, I saw an ad on French TV that promoted uh, to drink dairy milk every day. And at the end, it said it is co-financed by the European Union in collaboration with one of the uh, lobby associations. And so these are examples that just kind of make you realize how much power lies behind the agricultural lobby and what actually lies behind every policy. And that goes back to what George was saying before, is how some companies and some networks and associations are just dominating the field. And you can demand for consumers to change, but if you do not even create the system that enables them to change, if, if we do not have the options, um, if we do not take into account that we need the necessary policies, that we need the necessary funding. We are subsidizing in billions every year. We are subsidizing extremely harmful farming practices instead of pouring all of our money into a transition that would transition into an environmentally friendly and sustainable system. We still have not managed to change, to make it easy for consumers to change. This goes back to the whole concept of behavioral economics and that it would be so easy and simple to just nudge people in the direction of more environmentally sustainable products. Currently, the default option is almost always the meat option. If you want a plant-based option, you have to specifically ask for it. You have to go to places, you have to research places where you can find it. And that is a huge problem in our system. And there is still so much resistance. I, I remember when I was in, uh, in my undergraduate, I tried to convince my college to change the default option in, for formal dinners so that the default option was plant-based or at least vegetarian and not the meat option because it's been shown that that is incredibly powerful. There were studies um, in Germany, for instance, where they changed the default option of uh, that they took a, like one German town as an example, and they changed the default option of energy pro of the energy provider to be renewable. And 90% of people stuck with the renewable energy provider. That is how powerful the default option is. And these would be simple things that you could implement, but there is so much resistance because people feel like they would be imposing a choice on people. But aren't we doing that already? Like there is always something in the default option. <laughs> it's not like we are changing. It's not like we are adding a default option. We are currently pushing people in the other direction. And it would be so simple to make changes to push them in a different direction that would not impose any, that would not be imposing a choice that would just be imposing a different choice. And it wouldn't be imposing. It would just be leading people towards a choice. That would be better for everyone. Thank you, Emma. Sebastian, lots to reply to you, so I'll let you reply. <laughs> no, thank you very much. I, I mean, Emma's just come to exactly my point. Uh, we are claiming that we have policies that are preserving the freedom of choice, what actually they are already constraining. So the idea that these new ecological policies on the demand side would be a dictatorship of behaviors or behavior like... Uh, uh, dictating what our behaviors should be or virtuous, uh, how virtuous they should be. This is not the point, is that some of the options that could be, f you, you, we need to make options available to make the choice freer. And, and that's the way to be able to be much freer to choose the sustainable and nutritious option rather than the other one. 
The other thing that I wanted to react to, because I think you had planned to, to ask me that question, uh, Alice, is about uh, the experience we have with the uh, co common agricultural policy uh, and, the, and the farm to fork policy in the European Union. Um, so uh, at, at IDRI, we are a think tank really trying to uh, uh, re make proposals for uh, a transition towards uh, what the IPCC and the IPDS are telling us what is the staying within the planetary boundaries. And this is why we support the farm to fork strategy of the European Union. Farm to fork is within the European Green Deal, a strategy that takes the whole food system and not just agriculture, but also the food system, the food processing, retailing, and the food environment of the consumer, and trying to, to um, have a series of regulations to help reach the objective to be uh, carbon neutral and protecting biodiversity and zero pollution. So there are very ambitious objectives, particularly concerning pesticides, for instance, and we use too many pests, too much pesticides in France and in Europe in general. And in France, already in 2008, 2008 there is the objective to reduce by half uh, the use of pesticides in France in 10 years. And then a comma was added, if possible, and then the objective was dropped, actually. And so we are still increasing in the use of pesticides. So that's really the example of a, 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 a fake transition policy. It's okay to give time for farmers to change, but then you need to be serious about the end point and the sanction if, it's, if we do always procrastinate and, and if we don't reach the objective. That objective of the farm to fork strategy has been heavily fought by the USDA. The USDA published a study saying, if you do that, you're going to make the world starve. And we published a response to that saying, well, this is if you don't take into account the fact that we also have demand policy, demand side policies, and, and that if we eat less meat, we need to produce less veg vegetable products to feed the animals, and then we can afford to have less productive uh, wheat productions or less productive, uh, uh, I mean, the yields per hectare that would be lower if we use, uh, if, if we use less pesticides. But so th this was quite strange. It's not to accuse the US, it's just to show how strategic it is, because this is really US versus Europe in food policy. This is a story that dates back. Uh, I mean, this is a long story. It's not new. But uh, and, and the other ones who really used uh, a lot of the food sector, and in particular the agrochemicals, they are using the, the Russian war in Ukraine to say, you see, we need to feed the world. And I completely concur with George. We have a system that is so much specialized on some commodities that travel around the planet that it's not resilient. But it's not true that the problem for Sub-Saharan Africa is Ukrainian wheat. Ukrainian wheat is not eaten by so many of the uh, Sub-Saharan African eaters. In Egypt, it matters. In some Eastern African uh, countries, it matters. But globally, this is not the point. And we don't need in Europe to produce more wheat to feed, to feed. I, I'm just uh, reacting also, I think the title of the conference today is Feeding the World. And, and this is really, I don't know how that translates. Maybe it's my, my, my French understanding of the, of the thing, but it's not, nobody has to feed the world. People have to feed themselves to some extent. That's very important. And using the Feeding the World narrative, there has been a lot of impetus saying, we need to produce a lot in Europe to feed the world. Well, actually, we import a lot of soybeans to feed our animals, and we are not net exporters, we are, we are net importers. So it's not true that we need to produce more, we need to import less of that soybeans, and we could really do something that would be much more sustainable. Well, I want to, uh, so, so, so I, I just want to say it's, uh, because we're talking also about how we communicate to society. So 15 years ago, I was involved in that study with uh, the two uh, main research institutes, agricultural research institutes in France, INRA and CIRAD. And the, the idea was to say how to feed the world in 2050. Again, we were in the same, uh, who, who's the subject of the feeding? <laughs> who's feeding whom? But how to feed the world in 2050? And, and at the same time, the FAO was saying we need to double food product, global agricultural output to be able to feed the world. And we, we, others in, 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 in Austria, the, uh, the socio-ecological center uh, in Klagenfurt and others, have published around 29, 2010, a whole of studies saying, no, we don't need to double global agricultural output because we need also to work on the demand side of things. And that opens up a lot of possibilities to not just destroy the environment for, to ensure in food security. It's not true that we need to get rid of environmental regulations on agricultural land in order to, to uh, produce a lot everywhere and feed the world. This is not true. We showed that 
through a variety of scenarios, et cetera, in about around 2009, 2010. But just today, the mere fact that people are scared about food security because of the Russian war in Ukraine enables that we get back 15 years in the debate. And we, need, we would need to just uh, say that again, but it's a very powerful argument. The cereal producers in Paris are talking to the president of France saying, you see, we need to produce more. So get rid let's get rid of the pesticide reduction objective. It's too, too complicated. I believe President Macron is not naive. He understands that what the cereal producers in France want is to take back the markets that the Ukrainians, Ukrainians and Russians have taken from France, which was feeding the Arab countries with French wheat. Now it's Russian and Ukrainian wheat that is feeding them. So this is just a matter of economic competition. It's not so much food security. Food security is a lot about eating less, not, no, of course, not in Africa and South, South, South Asia, but being cautious of, and sufficient in what we eat. And it's about food sovereignty and agency of people, not so much about us producing a lot to feed people there. Um, I would have another story also on, on, on um, what George has been saying about the resilience of the food system. I just, in one sentence, to be short, uh, I completely concur with, with George that the system is really not resilient. And the, 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 this issue of pesticides, for instance, is the way that agrochemical industries are saying we are making this system resilient because through chemistry, we are ensuring that the new pests coming with climate change are not going to damage your crops. We advocate a lot more about the fact that pesticides are actually damaging soil organisms, and we don't know how much they are. Uh, and we need to be very cautious about that. So precautionary principle would be to really get chemicals in agriculture as the last uh, last resort. Is that possible in, in English to say that? Last resort, uh, th that you recur to them only in the end while you've tried many other things. So it's, not the, it's, it's a new way of looking at risks in agriculture, but resilience in the system would be much more ensured by more complex landscapes, more complex crop rotations, re-diversification of the regions that we have specialized. And I think that's one of the things that we, the types of narratives that we need to also look at and to challenge. Thank you very, thank you very much. Thank you both. George, back to you. Um, I would like to give you also a chance to respond and also just to pick up on this idea of grand narratives to kind of destabilize. If you could speak also specifically about the pastoral ideal that you talk about at the end of the book and other grand narratives that you're trying to undermine in your book, Regenesis. So th thank you. And, and first of all, I say that I agree with, with the great majority of what Sebastian has said. And you know, pesticides in particular are an urgent threat to life on Earth. Um, in fact, we, again, know almost nothing about their wider impacts, particularly in the soil. You know, people talk about bees. Yeah, and that's really important. But actually, the impacts on soil food webs are probably just as important as the impacts on the food webs above the ground. And we just have almost no knowledge of what they are. We do know that, for instance, neonicotinoid pesticides um, uh, kill or disrupt the reproduction of, of very large numbers of soil invertebrates. And you know, again, it's one of those things which it could be one of the greatest threats that we face on Earth, and yet we know almost nothing about it. Um, one word of caution I would um, throw in um, in response to what Sebastian has said, which is this, that, that you know, while as far as possible, we should be feeding ourselves locally. You know, and there's a lot to be said for a lo local everything um, to the greatest extent possible. It's mathematically not possible to feed everyone that way. And, and the reason for that is that where the majority of human beings live in big, dense sit settlements, primarily in cities, is not where most of the agricultural land is. And the um, hinterland of those cities um, it is often relatively small in terms of its production. Um, there was a um, study published um, asking um, how, how much of our food on average um, could, could be produced uh, within 100 kilometers of where everyone lives, and it's 25%. Um, the, the average minimum distance over which grain could be supplied to those who need it on Earth is 2,200 kilometers. Um, and the reason for that is, is that very large amounts of our grain are grown in huge sparsely habited lands, such as the US Midwest, the Canadian prairies, the Brazilian interior, the, the Russian steppes, the Ukrainian Chernozem. And you know, there are there are various 
structural reasons you could point to, but the fundamental problem is a mathematical reason that 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 grain and, and other commodities do have to be imported in into large areas of, of the world because there simply isn't enough fertile land or indeed enough fresh water to 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 grow those commodities where people are, are, are living. So yeah, localize where possible, but don't see it as a panacea. And it's certainly not either an, an environmental cure for all ills, because uh, while there is an environmental cost to food transport, it's generally far, far smaller than other components of the environmental cost of food. And the biggest component of that, and this brings me on, Alice, to, to the question you want me to address, is, is meat. You know, the, the environmental cost of, of meat is, is a lot higher than the environmental cost of plant-based products, even if most of them have been um, moved around the world. In fact, um, my estimates drawing on um, um, uh, scientific accounts of um, the greenhouse gas impacts of beef suggests that you would have to ship a kilo of beans 100 times around the planet before they had the same greenhouse gas impact of a kilo of beef produced in the field next door to your house. So, you know, we've massively exaggerated the impacts of food miles, but not the impacts of the particular kinds of food which we might be eating. And this is why, and I think all three of us agree, you know, the biggest shift in environmental terms that you can make is to switch towards a plant-based diet. And, and beef and lamb are, are by far and away the most damaging components of, of an animal-based diet because of their enormous land use, usage um, the, and their very high greenhouse gas impacts. But, um, and this goes to your question, we have fetishized their production, not just recently, but across thousands of years. You can go back in the secular tradition to Theocritus, the Greek poet, writing in uh, the third century BC, looking back nostalgically to his native Sicily from Alexandria, this busy city across the Mediterranean. And, and he uh, portrayed the lives of the shepherds in Sicily as being one of innocence and purity. All they did all day was to lie under the trees and talk and play music and, oh yeah, have sex with each other, but they didn't do any actual work. Whereas here in Alexandria in the city, it's all lies and corruption and it's evil. Um, and then you had a very similar um, biblical tradition um, going right to the beginning of the Old Testament, you know, where the good people were the herders of animals. So Cain, the tiller of the ground, the evil guy, kills Abel, the herder of beasts, the beloved of God. Um, and and the, the people who wrote the Old Testament were the settled descendants, the urban descendants of, of pastoralists, of, of, of cattle and sheep and, and, and camel and donkey herders. Um, and, and so the good people were their ancestors and the good way to live was how their ancestors lived. And even though they were themselves urban people, they invade against the city, against Sodom and Gomorrah. Woe to the bloody city, it is all lies and deception, the prey departeth not. And when Jesus comes along, he's both the good shepherd and Agnes Dei, the lamb of God. And he tells his disciples to feed my sheep. And they become the first pastors. And pastor, of course, is Latin for shepherd, but has also come to mean priest. And it's still the case that in the Western church today, the bishop's pastoral staff is in the shape of a shepherd's crook. Um, and then, then Virgil picks up Theocritus's tradition, and you get this, this big secular flow of pastoral poetry. Um, and then in the Renaissance, the, the secular tradition and the religious tradition are really brought together by people like Dante, by Plutarch, by um, Boccaccio. And then it moves to England in a big way, too, with um, Spencer and Herbert and Marlowe and Shakespeare promoting this the same story that you know it's innocence and purity is found in the shepherding life I mean Shakespeare takes the piss out of it somewhat as he you know takes the piss out of everything but he's still you know the the the, the thrust of it is 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 still there and it becomes a very powerful political analogy the 
the good ruler is a good shepherd and the good subjects are the good sheep. And then it kind of died in the 18th century, killed partly by a magnificent poem in England, at any rate, by George Crabbe called The Village, which is saying, actually, all that is bullshit. You poets on your downy couches, romanticising the lives of the rural poor are actually doing them a disservice. It's not like that. It never was like that. Um, you wouldn't want to live like them. You, you've created a, a stupendous mythology and that pretty well killed it until the 20th century. And then it came roaring back in two particular forms. One was books for very young children, pre-literate children, right at the dawning of consciousness. And I don't know how it is in France, but here in the UK, about 50% of them are about livestock farms. It's amazing. Uh, not a livestock farm of the sort you'd ever recognize. There's one cow, one sheep, one pig, one cat, one chicken, one duck, one horse, one rosy cheeked farmer, and they all talk to, to each other and they're all part of a big happy family. And there's no sense of why they might be there or where they might be going, right? And that's, so that's one aspect of it, which is embedded, imbued in us from the earliest stages, the first flickerings of consciousness. We're brought up with the belief that the livestock farm is a place of peace and harmony could not be further from the truth. When I was a teenager, I worked on an intensive pig farm and every day, two thoughts came crashing into my head. One was, was this isn't what I was told farming was about. And the second was, why is this legal? You know, if we treated our cats and dogs the way we treat pigs, we would be sent to prison. And yet it's become totally normalized that this is how we treat pigs. Um, so there's that strand, but then there's also the romanticization on TV which is another aspect of the pastoral uh, idyll. I mean, I, I don't know again how it is in France, but uh, the BBC, if the BBC were any keener on sheep, it would be illegal, right? Every Sunday night, there's some romantic film about shepherds with their sheep. And, you know, they don't tell you any of the realities of it, you know, like how they actually make their living, which is through subsidies, because no one makes money out of sheep. Um, but it's just you know, this massively romanticized thing. And of course, the Wild West myth was another aspect of, of the pastoral romance. Yeah, a very similar story to the one Theocritus told, you know, these, these noble people out under the stars singing their songs and telling their stories. They're not having sex with each other, at least until Brokeback Mountain. Uh, uh, but, you know, the reality, of course, was utterly brutal. It was genocide. It was land capture and expansion on a vast scale. In fact, in fact um, cattle and sheep farming is the major driver historically and in many parts of the world still today of colonial expropriation land grabbing and the dispossession of indigenous people but we've romanticized this monstrous business um, and as a result of that we've swept under the carpet its environmental impacts its social impacts its humanitarian impacts its animal welfare impacts all of that we just don't want to know because it's so deeply embedded in our consciousness that it's become what the cognitive historian Jeremy Lent, one of the greatest thinkers on earth in my view, calls a root metaphor. And a root metaphor is an idea um, so incorporated into our consciousness that we no longer recognize it as an idea. Thank you. I'm looking at the time and I imagine there are many questions in the audience. Would I be right to think? Can you raise your hand if you have if you would have a question if I open it up to questions? OK, great, because I do have other questions, but I, we did promise you half an hour of Q&A. So I'll give the mic. First of all, give me a big round of applause, please. Thank you so much. It was fantastic. Uh, and so we want to invite this is the democratic part of the of the conversation. So I'll give the mic to Emily and she'll come. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's OK. Thank you. <laughs> Who's got a question? Thank you. So much. Thanks, and I, I don't think I've seen a panel that agrees so much. It's very, agree very agreeable. Um, if, I, if I could just um, build on George's rural metaphor there, um, and the, we, we've seen the urban-rural divide increasing in the last decade or more, economically, politically, socially, educationally. Um, is there a double dividend to be had? from a, a rural regeneration into a more climate friendly, climate resilient fashion, because the, the key is to hold out a more positive vision for to, to bring the rural sector 
along. I wonder if our speakers could reflect on that a bit. You have no mic, Alice. How should we proceed? Shall, sh shall I say something briefly about that? Would that be okay? Yes, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, because uh, in a classic example, it, it is a very pertinent and important question. You know, in a classic example of where things have gone very badly wrong is in the Netherlands, of course, with the nitrate crisis. And there's no doubt governments mishandled this crisis massively. You know, if they'd if they'd heeded the warnings in the 1980s, they could have gradually reduced the nitrate problem. And you wouldn't have hit this political cliff edge, which they've hit, you know, with the 2019 state council ruling uh, that um, allowing so much nitrate to go into the ground and the water is uh, uh, um, offends European law. And so it has to be stopped. And the result of that is that the prime primary causes of nitrate pollution, livestock farms, some of them, about 3000 of them have to be shut down. And of course, what we've seen happening there is partly because of the extremely compressed timeline, because politicians left it so late, you know, because, because they were, they succumbed to the lobbying of the farm sector, and it was just too difficult, let's just leave it, let's not, you know, who, who cares about what the scientists are saying, who cares what's happening in the rivers, you know, they don't vote for us, the farmers vote for us. And, and they're a culturally powerful lobby. There might not be very many farmers, they might not be any, a very big economic lobby, but culturally they have a huge amount of power and they bring a lot of people with them. As we've seen recently with the triumph in the regional elections in the Netherlands of the BBB, the, 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 the Farmers' Party. Um, and, and, so, and so the government procrastinated um, and, and then so sort of had this very difficult um, decision to try to enforce. And what then happened was the issue got weaponized by the far right, not just in the Netherlands, but around the world. And in a way that I find truly terrifying because they immediately meshed it with the great replacement um, th theory. What, 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 the, what the government's real agenda is, what the real conspiracy going on here is to expel the true people of the land the backbone of the Netherlands and to replace them with immigrants. That, that became the story, which shamefully some of the farmers themselves then picked up and, and, and began to amplify. And, you know, it was picked up by Tucker Carlson on Fox News RIP, uh, by a whole series of really nasty far-right outlets around the world. Now, the Great Replacement Theory is, is dangerous enough at any time, but when it's applied to farming, it's basically a recapitulation of Hitler's blood and soil story, because that, that was saying exactly the same thing. It was saying the true German people of the land of the farmers, um, uh, the, 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 there's a cosmopolitan elite conspiracy um, by aliens to throw them off the land and, and replace them. And these days we don't say cosmopolitans, they say globalists, but it basically means the same thing. You know, in, in Hitler's day, obviously it was the Jews he was talking about. Uh, there's still a lot of anti-Semitism, obviously within the great replacement theory, but there's other people as well who are brought into this. Um, they, they talk about aliens. Um, uh, Hitler talked about aliens, but immigrants, you know, has exactly the same meaning here. It, it's, it's the same story and it's absolutely terrifying. And what we're seeing now in many parts in rural areas, these are becoming the strongholds of the far right. And obviously, for the reasons you point out, we have to address these issues. We are seeing a very wide divide opening up and we're seeing a great deal of xenophobia. In, in rural areas um, um, towards uh, both people from else from other countries, but also towards urban people. You know, town is, is, is a big insult here in the UK. You know, rural people talk about those, those bloody townies um, uh, again and again. And, and, and so somehow we have to find ways of crossing that divide. And I, I recognize that I'm not helping. <laughs> I know I'm not helping, I'm trying to, draw attention to issues which I think are extremely urgent, massive environmental issues. But of course, in doing so, I make farmers very upset and I probably further stoke the rage which is leading to that rural urban divide. But someone's got to say it. 
you know, I don't mind being the lightning rod. I don't mind being the one who gets demonized for this because someone's got to say, it. I've got a thick skin. Um, you know, it, it, it doesn't really affect me. But somehow we have to bridge that divide while also being honest about the issues. You know, we have to be honest about the fact that the Netherlands has got a massive nitrate crisis. It's completely unsustainable. It's trashing the rivers. It's, it's trashing the soil. It's trashing the, the marine ecosystem as well. You know, we can't lie about that. We can't pretend it's not happening. But, you know, we have to find ways of bringing people with us. And that can be very difficult indeed, especially when our agendas are so different. You know, I want to see a lot of land currently used for livestock farming rewilded. It's, it could be the only way now that we prevent the sixth great extinction from happening. But of course, that's that's absolute horror to to livestock farmers, and they regard me as a devil incarnate as a result. Yeah, just to add a couple of points to thank you very much, George. I think you uh, summarised many of the points extremely well. Um, just to add to the issue of extreme polarization when it comes to climate action and. Something that struck me was a conversation that I heard a couple of weeks ago, and that was on, um, it was an Austrian podcast, and they were speaking about recent uh, activism by um, more so-called radical activists. And someone called in saying that her father, who's a farmer, would never, kind of would never be convinced by that kind of activism. Um, but she also didn't have an answer to what kind of activism would work in in his case. And that made me think that actually it's quite paradoxical that agriculture is a key pillar of our system. Like agriculture is an extremely, extremely important sector. It's just not working currently as it is, but it is an extremely important sector. And farmers, uh, and the entire agricultural system is one that will and already is being the most affected, one of the most affected sectors when it comes to the consequences of the climate crisis and global heating. And it's actually quite ironic that this sector that is so affected, they're already experiencing millions and billions of losses every year they are already insurance companies are already saying that they have to change their system because they cannot afford to pay for all of the losses anymore. And instead of being the group that is the biggest advocate for change, that they need help to transition, that you, this cannot continue because the profession cannot continue like that and we need a different system. They're the ones that are often the most opposed to any sort of climate action and want to keep the status quo. And so given my research with um, citizens' climate assemblies, I was wondering if potentially this approach and having farmers' climate assemblies could be a, an interesting solution or at least an interesting starting point to bridge the gap a little bit because it worked surprisingly well in the setting of the citizens climate assemblies, you had farmers involved in that climate assembly and they still came up with those recommendations that were a lot more ambitious than anything that governments had previously come up with. And also they're much more supported by the general society because they don't see it as coming from a particular political party, but as coming from representatives from society. So that's something that I've been wondering about in the recent weeks is potentially this could be an interesting, experiment if we put together an assembly of farmers in a specific country and explain the problem and kind of let them also share their experience with climate effects and and go through the different climate effects that have been happening and what their ideas are on how to tackle them and so that it's not such a top down we're imposing these new regulations but that is we are building up a new solution together um, because we need farmers we need agriculture um, so yeah, this is something that I've been thinking about and I think it's, um, it would be interesting to consider, but I will pass on to you, Sebastian. Thank you, Emma. It's really easy to, to start from where you, you left it because to some extent what we try to do at Tidri is to work with the farming sector on the pathway to uh, 
uh, farming sector and, and farming production regions in France, in Europe, that would be carbon neutral and biodiversity positive by 2050. So, of course, when people look at the numbers, it's about reducing the number of cows, pigs, and poultry, reducing the yields at the end of the period. And we try to build that with farmers. And there are many farmers that are actually looking for an alternative, but the majority farmers union in France is not ready to, to accept that. So they are quite well aware and represented, but the internal dynamics are very complicated, of course. And you're, you're right, maybe a, a convention could be a way to, to get them forward. I just want to add in the picture, not just the farmers, because they are not that numerous, as George said. But if you look at Brittany, Brittany, before uh, the industrialization of farming, was a, an underdeveloped country uh, within France, very poor, no infrastructures. And it's through modernization of agriculture, dairy uh, and uh, pig, that they became uh, quite a rich region in France, uh, very intensive, but lots of the jobs are in the food processing industry. So we need to look at the uh, farmers and the food processing jobs. Uh, actually, in France, when we had a lot of deindustrialization, a lot of loss in industrial jobs in the industrial jobs in the last decades, the ones that remain in regions are the food processing industry. And Brittany is full of small SMEs, etc., with uh, that are uh, doing uh, emmental, mass emmental, and mass ham. That is really not interesting to me, uh, but that's how Brittany is rich. So your question is about how can we make a project for Brittany to stay prosperous but doing something different so we try to discuss with them how to use i mean Brittany is also known for having too many like, like just like the netherlands already in the 80s everybody was saying there is an excess of pig for the environment I mean, you can't digest so much pig shit in Brittany. The, the environment cannot digest that you could build massive uh, sewage plants of course but that would be completely nonsense but but so so that's that's everybody knows that. But we are like for the Netherlands, just over the cliff, saying we'll try to manage that rather than saying we need to reduce the numbers, reduce the volume of output, and go for the value. So moving up market is a business strategy that could be appealing. And you have seen a representative of the farming sector in Brittany saying that in the press, the the regional press, West France, and they were then attacked by others saying. This is an internal discussion. You know, you're not allowed to say that openly because that was that's so strategic for them. So I think it's very important that we look with them at, at what are the jobs in the processing industry and in farming that are going to make these regions thrive and continue to be prosperous. That's a very important discussion to have. So opening up from farmers to also other people that have stakes in agriculture without being farmers themselves is something important. And then one thing on which I disagree <laughs> with George is that I believe that there are, there are many areas where we actually can have biodiversity on farmland. Uh, and we need so rewilding is not necessarily, to my standards, just getting agriculture out of these hectares, but ensuring that we have agricultural practices that are compatible with biodiversity. That means very often de-intensifying, so extensification, and George would probably say, if we had time, and I know that time is short, that if you extensify, then you need more land. But that depends on how much we eat. So I, I think we need to have that conversation, but I don't see a future in Europe without extensifying our practices. When you look around Paris, livestock has been disappearing, so we have vegetable production everywhere, and the water agency is looking for grassland uh, with extensive pasture and to at least a farmer could live out of that or be having an activity out of that. Lots of subsidies are with George, so living out of the, his activity is something different. But the, we're looking for grassland around Paris to ensure that we have water quality, because water quality under grassland is so much better than under the intensive vegetable production that we have. So I think, I'm, I, I believe for that reason, agronomic reason, there are places where we need extensive livestock. There are Mediterranean areas where you can do nothing else than having grazing or uh, it's the maquis, it's the uh, Mediterranean pasture land, and it's not damaging biodiversity to the extent uh, if we if it's extensive enough. I, I, I'm not Scottish, but I believe land uh, production in some Scottish areas is okay for biodiversity. And so I believe there are places where it's not a trade-off between biodiversity 
uh, food, uh, vegetable food or animals, you could have biodiversity and feed. And anyway, you can't grow crops on those areas. So I think that's, that's where I would, I, I, and I'm using that also strategically to tell the farmers, we love, we, we love what you do, no need to, be, uh, to, to rewild your land. And that's where I probably disagree with, with George on that because that's, I think it's politically dangerous and, and but we maybe if it's completely true, then we need to face the politically dangerous things. I believe it's also not true everywhere. And it's also very important to look at how we can really put biodiversity and agricultural production on the same area, something that, that does function. Could I very briefly respond to- Yes, just well, we, we finally have a moment of conflict. So let's have the conflict. <laughs> Please you. respond. <laughs> yeah, no, th thank you, Sebastian, for everything you said. I mean, so, you know, if we talk about Scotland, which is an area I do know pretty well, um, it's one of the most biodiversity depleted places on Earth, and that is almost entirely because of two factors. One, the massive population of sheep, and two, the, uh, the massive population of deer. Now, why are there so many deer? Well, it's uh, for a similar reason that all the predators have been killed. There are no wolves, there are no lynx, there's nothing which can eat deer. And why have they been killed? because of the livestock industry. The livestock industry everywhere, all over uh, the, the world, wants to kill large predators and largely excludes large predators. It, it drives the campaign to ensure large predators are killed. Um, nowhere on earth has what would um, be e ecologically natural um, populations of large predators. They're everywhere suppressed and in most cases, um, well, many cases removed altogether, particularly in the whole of the UK. We can't bring back the wolves and the lynx because of the lobbying by the livestock industry. An ecosystem cannot function properly without large predators. And when people say, oh, that, that pastoral ecosystem is a healthy ecosystem, then it's missing almost all its crucial components. They say it's mimicking nature. It's not. It's a very crude caricature of nature. Now, Scotland would be a forested nation if it weren't for the sheep and it weren't for the overpopulation of deer. Um, uh, but it's an almost entirely bare nation. It's got one of the lowest um, uh, um, areas of forest in, in Europe. And the same goes for the UK as a whole. We've just got 13%. And that is almost entirely driven by grazing livestock. All our uplands are bare. There's almost no trees above 200 metres anywhere in Britain. And that's not because that's where the tree line is. You know, the tree line in most of Britain would be um, 1,200, 1,500 metres, um, the altitudinal tree line. It's simply because of the grazing of animals. Now, if you were to bring down livestock numbers to the point where trees can return, which is the absolute barest minimum of regeneration, you know, if you're in a formerly forested area or, or an area which supported trees and there are no trees, that is not a regenerated area. You know, to have at least some trees returning you would need to bring down sheep numbers to five per square kilometre, one sheep per 20 hectares. Now, already at current concentrations, one per hectare, one per two hectares, it's completely uneconomic. It's a total farce. It's sustained only by subsidies. But that's way above the point at which ecological regeneration can happen. And yet they say this is regenerative agriculture. There's nothing regenerative about that. It's a wasteland. Um, and because there are no trees, and indeed because almost all the other uh, palatable vegetation has been selectively browsed out by the sheep. There's almost nothing of anything else either. There are vast tracts of upland Britain where you can walk all day and not see a single bird. There are dead zones where the entire ecosystem has been tipped over the edge. It has collapsed and it supports nothing except a couple of species of plant, a coarse grass called melinia and perhaps a bit of sphagnum moss underneath it. And there's no insects, there's no birds. It's a silent landscape. And the only thing which has caused that has been animal grazing. Now, there's a grand mistake which many people make. And I don't know, you know, because you know, we need to talk about numbers if we're to pin this down, but it's to confuse um, what uh, the use of livestock as a conservation tool with livestock farming. Now, there is a role for large herbivores, particularly for cattle and, and, and ponies, um, in maintaining uh, what uh, ecologists call an intermediate disturbance state. So a mosaic of, of habitats, of, of trees, of, of rough pasture, of regenerating scrub, of all sorts of things happening within, within one zone. But 
But the number of livestock you need to do that without trashing the ecosystem is absolutely tiny. So the exemplar of this in the United Kingdom is, is net wildland. It's this um, uh, larger state which used to be growing wheat, which has been rewilded. It's very famous. Um, and, and, and they and other people say, oh, well, this is the way to farm livestock because look, all the wildlife's coming back and we're producing livestock. Well, you're producing such a tiny number of livestock that you can't call it farming at all. I mean, they're producing 54 kilograms of meat per hectare per year. If we were to uh, turn 10% of the UK over to their system, we would eat, get to eat meat three times a year, um, uh, three meals a year, and we would have nothing else to eat from that whole 10% of the land. I mean, it's just, it's not a farming system. It, it, you might confuse it with one because you will occasionally see a cow or a pony, but they're in tiny, tiny numbers. It's in fact completely different to a livestock production system. And so this confusion has caused people to get totally different things tangled up and to make a grave mistake about what a healthy ecosystem is and is not. Thank you. I don't know that we can. Are you okay? okay. <laughs> you're in person, so we can maybe continue. We wish you were here. We very much wish you were here in person, George, because obviously one of the reasons people want to speak at the American Library in Paris is to be in Paris. But uh, we'll continue the conversation a little bit afterwards. I want to make sure that we have time for one more audience question. Yes, we'll have to do a rapid fire reply, I think, because we have about five minutes. Oh, I might have been the wrong person to give a mic to. Um, okay, I'll be quick. I'll be quick. Um, so I think we can all agree that agriculture is one of the most destructive uh, sectors of our society that we have created. And I think we can also agree that it is one of the most intersectional and interrelated to all other sectors of our society. And what is the biggest sector of our society aside from the economy, right? So I'm very curious as to, we haven't really mentioned the drivers of all of this uh, uh, destruction and ecological and social harm. What is the main driver of the economy? Profits, right? Capitalism, making sure that we grow, we grow, we grow, that we continue to accumulate wealth, power, money, um, just for that sake, right? Not really for any other logical reason, but just because that's the way we've been told that we should do things, right? And that's the way that our economy should work. Um, and so how can we expect our policies after Emma just told us about the very, very powerful lobbyists who, of course, are allowed, not even just allowed, encouraged to accumulate and accumulate wealth and power to influence laws, influence members of European parliaments, influence local mayors, or even uh, infiltrate uh, 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 social resistance movements, etc. cetera. Um, how can we expect our politicians, our movements to change the way that agriculture works to become less destructive if the main underlying reason for our agricultural system is to create wealth, right? That is what we grow food for, at least in the, in the majority of the global north, not for subsistence. We, the major companies grow food in order to make money and create profit. And if something comes in the way of making money and making profit, they're going to do everything that they can. Sorry, I know you're really in, want the mic back. You know, they're, they're going to do everything that they can in order to stop any kind of uh, uh, obstruction to their profit and wealth creation. So the question is one of capitalism, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, this to some extent we've been touching about uh, about that uh, uh, that that purpose without saying it by saying uh, we need to regulate much more uh, the way the, um, the, 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 the power is functioning in the, in the food system downstream and upstream of the farmers. And I think that's something is more, more polite, no, not politely, but more softly said than what you said. I'm, I'm trying to, I've been trying uh, for, for, for years to discuss with the food industry, what is a sufficiency oriented business model? Uh, does it function in the current capitalist model that you sell less uh, and continue thriving economically? Probably it does not. Uh, I mean, Danone cannot sell more yogurts uh, because we we can't eat. It's not tr nutritionally interesting to eat more yogurts than what they sell. Uh, and Emmanuel Faber was trying to say we need to shift to another business model. He had maybe other flaws, I don't know, but he was also fired because that was not enough in line with the profits for the shareholders. So there is something to be done there. I completely concur with you. The other thing is that already, even in the current capitalistic system, the way 
power, I mean, there is a competition problem, the way there are oligopolies or quasi oligopolies that have too much power. And that's also a problem. So let's already regulate what we can. And let's address also the fact that maybe the capitalism as it is, very illustratively in the food system is not enabling that we stay within planetary boundaries. So we need to address that in the second step necessarily. Uh, yeah, George, why don't you go and then we'll, we'll end with Emma. Okay. So, uh, the question of capitalism, you have about a minute. <laughs> sure. So, uh, I mean, it's amazing how often we discuss capitalism without actually defining what it is. Um, and I, I see capitalism really as originating in the 1450s on Madeira, because that was a place where for the first time you saw the commodification of land, labor and money, Karl Polanyi's three conditions for capitalism. And looking at it that way, I feel I have a definition of capitalism. It might not be everyone's definition of capitalism, but it's, it's I see it as an economic system founded on colonial looting that operates on a constantly shifting and self-consuming frontier on which both state and powerful private interests use their laws backed by the threat of violence to turn shared resources into exclusive property and to transform natural wealth, labor and money into commodities that can be accumulated. It, it is a predatory system. <laughs> you know, we can't, th th there's no way of modifying capitalism to make it planet friendly or for that matter, human friendly. You know, it, it was founded in predation and it, it, it sustains itself in predation. Um, and, but it's almost blasphemy to say this, you know, it's the moment you start to criticize capitalism as a whole, as opposed to, you know, corporate capitalism or crony capitalism, any of the adjectives we attach it, you know, suddenly you are outside the pale of acceptable opinion. Um, but we have to, we have to face this, we have to recognize that, that we are facing a system that from the very beginning burnt through planetary resources. And that's the same in agriculture as anywhere else. And what we do about it, well, that would be a whole other hour and a half or year and a half discussion. Emma? Yes, okay, better. Um, I definitely do not have enough time to um, go into the intricacies of uh, this huge issue. I think something that stood out to me is that this kind of the agricultural system is kind of ref representing even more than just like normal capitalist systems, because not only do you have huge, huge companies and oligopolies that create a lot of money, but you have billions of public money going in as well to subsidize this very harmful system. So I think the very short answer is that there has to be a complete systemic change, what we first pour public money into, and then how we regulate private actors in that field and how we build up a, an economy that is focused on circularity and that is not focused on economic growth and what changing the metrics and changing the indicators, how we measure um, different farming methods and who gets public money and who doesn't get public money and what gets subsidized. And I think that is the first key lever to address and in shifting that system. And the reason I wanted to end is just to illustrate the extent of this um, system and of the numbers, um, because George, you were mentioning at the very beginning that we often are not aware of like the numbers that stand behind the agricultural system is what I did before this talk is I let a counter run. And throughout the time of this talk in 1.5 hours, 11 million chickens have been killed for human consumption, 220,000 pigs, 60,000 cows, and 160 million wild caught fish in 90 minutes. <laughs>